Hi, this is Greg Weissman, the voice of Lucas Carr, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Michael Greenway, D, 6, 2. Hello team. Today we have a very exciting episode planned because this is the second of our special Patreon guest episodes. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Michael Greenway, one of our top tier patrons. Michael is, of course, a big fan of Young Justice, and at the generous Patreon tier at which he has chosen to support our show, he's gotten the chance to be a special guest here on Whelmed. Outside of being one of our patrons, Michael is also a YouTuber making videos about comics, cartoons, and sci-fi. Michael, thank you for your support, and welcome to Whelmed. Thank you so much. I've been a fan of Whelmed for ages now, and it's such an honor to actually be here, and uh, I'm more than happy to give support to such a great podcast. Well, thank you very much. So, before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including all three seasons of the show so far, the comics, the video games, and even the audio play. So if you have not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in our intro, uh, but could you tell us a little more about who you are and what you do? Uh, certainly I can, Emily. Well, first things first, you may have noticed by my voice, I am British, so I am a foreign Young Justice fan, uh, but I'm also well known for being the founder of the Young Justice uh, Fans Deviant Art account, 3,000 followers and, and climbing, also the co-founder of Young Justice Season 3 on Deviant Art, and I am Dark Superboy on YouTube, who has done a myriad of Young Justice-related uh, videos, including the Young Justice live quizzes with uh, the cast and crew. Wonderful. So when did you first see Young Justice? Did you watch it on DVD or Netflix or all the way back on the original run? Or were you someone who kind of discovered it through DC Universe and things like that later later down the line? Uh, I've been a fan of Young Justice since day one. In fact, since uh, day minus one. Whenever I heard that the finally DC was going to be doing a new uh, animated series. I'd always caught myself at either the end or the middle of the series, such as Batman animated series or Justice League or uh, Teen Titans. I never started one from beginning to end. So I thought, like, this time, Young Justice, okay, from the beginning. And what I was seeing uh, just in the pre-production show, uh, shows and videos that Greg and Brandon released, uh, I was super excited to do it. And then I watched... Um, first episode, and I was hooked. For anyone who may be confused by the idea of coming into a show in the middle and not being able to see the beginning, these are, there, was, <laughs> there was a time before streaming where we had to, had to watch shows whenever they were on and reruns were hard to come by and everything was chaos. So, oh, early days of cartoons. Well, back in my day, I had the... Uh... I had some of the best ones, so I had X Men the animated series uh, to start off my day. But yes, if you ever missed an episode in the week, there was no internet to go back and find out the new one, so you had no idea what the heck was going on if you missed one. And this was why, for a very long time, superhero cartoons were episodic and did not have overarching storylines for this exact reason and problem. One hundred percent. I mean, you only got an one or two part episode and then there was like a tiny cliffhanger at the end of the season and sometimes shows didn't even know if they were going to get another season so they tried to wrap it up at the end of each season to uh please the fans so speaking of earlier cartoons uh what was your history with dc and comics in general before you saw young justice well again like like i said it was like i started halfway through like half the shows so my first ever DC animated experience was with Batman animated series, but it was the episode Batman in the Basement, which for any major fan of the Batman animated series knows that is really the most, isn't it, it's the one to get kids in, which ironically worked for me because it got me into it. 
So, yeah, it wasn't the highest of quality of stories and shows of episodes of the animated series, but it got me interested in the banana. Like, hey, there's these kids playing with Batman, playing with Batman. I can do that. I'm a kid. And then it led into um, Superman animated series, which, unfortunately, I got uh, halfway through when he, but missing the beginning of the Awakenings and all that stuff from Krypton's destruction. I think the first episode I ever watched was uh, with Lobo. Justice League was Justice League Star-Crossed uh, ending, so I got the spoilers of Hawk, of Hawk Girl's uh, ulterior plans and changing of sides and then the changing back. I watched uh, um, Justice League Unlimited, but I didn't get the Justice Lord references, so I was like, ah. Okay, Teen Titans. Teen Titans, I got started with the uh, Terror Betrayal, which made no sense to me at all it's like oh not again and then yeah so dc animated series and marvel animated series like trying to get from day one as a kid of the 80s and 90s was difficult to say the least particularly if you're in the uk where comics are kind of few and far between as well yeah i was kind of curious if that was more difficult to find stuff just because you know this happens whenever we have international guests we're like how, how do you get things? How do, how does the market work? Which most most nor, normal people have no real idea how any of that works, and that's fine. But yeah, interesting to know. Comics are harder to find over there. Well, um, yeah, it's DC Comics is really an American um, franchise that started with. I mean, the first issues of like Action Comics came over um, to the UK a lot later than. And it was released in America. And it is difficult for um, fans of DC and Marvel and Dark Horse and all those ones to get the original comics because they are so hard to find comic stores because you have to pay that additional fee to get everything transported over here. So it's more expensive for those beginning comic book stores to start with, which is such a hindrance to do. Nowadays, it's good old eBay uh, to get most of your things. And I was able to, or I have all the Young Justice comics um from start to end including the three ones um fortunately because the demand was high i was able to get everything there with the exception of the last three issues because the comic store sold me the wrong ones they sold me zorro instead of injustice because they went for y instead of z and i gave them a bad review and then they never sold me anything so the only way to get them was to ship the last three issues from overseas it was worth it though the things we do for comics. The things we do as fans. So uh, when we were trying to narrow down a topic for today to jump into our, our main discussion, we eventually landed on the idea of discussing how Young Justice uses time travel. So I think this will be fun. So let's jump into this wide ranging and strange bit of sci-fi that Young Justice has only touched on. So time travel, uh, I think, can be a really tricky storytelling tool uh for a lot of a lot of shows and a lot of any type of media because sometimes it opens way too many plot holes or breaks reality or runs the risk of just frustrating your audience by rewriting their favorite moments of an established story but despite all of those possible <laughs> really difficult writing challenges i think that yj makes it makes it work pretty well and part of that is they we've only touched on a little bit of time travel so far but i i trust that this show knows what it's doing with its whole giant plotted out timeline that goes so many years into the future and the past i'm sure it's all in greg's book his 500 page book of when and where and what will happen yes the giant the giant timeline that no one is allowed to see the holy grail of young justice books so how do you think, from your perspective as a fan, how do you think uh, Young Justice's use of time travel kind of compares to other interpretations of that concept in other media, since time travel is such a widespread trope and such a widespread sci-fi concept, uh, you can't help but compare it to other things. So how do you think YJ stacks up to some other ones? Well, as a child of Britain, we've kind of been since for the last 50 years, we've been growing up with the laws of uh, time travel from one time Lord in a TARDIS for generations. So we, we've had experience of it from 
a very early age of time travel as a plot device, which they successfully use 24-7 in all their episodes. And obviously that success all that time ago, 50 years going back, has picked up. I think it's been crossed over to other shows and sci-fi series that realised, heck, this can this is actually popular, this works, and this gives us such a wide range of things to do because you don't not only have you got any place in the universe to be, you've got any time in the universe to be. And so that experience, I think Doctor Who was one of the groundbreakers for use of time travel in any series and all other shows have kind of picked up on that from uh, Red Dwarf. I mean, to be to be fair, not to not to discount Doctor Who as someone who has watched quite a bit of it myself as well. I mean, time travel has existed in fiction going all the way back to H.G. Yeah. Wells, if not earlier. We have always been fascinated by the concept of what if, what if any time at any point. And so it's existed across media and fiction and science fiction for so long that I feel like it's just become this this thing that exists. So there are, there are time travel stories as their own mini subgenre of sci-fi. But Doctor Who is absolutely, of course, a very, very big, very, very fandomed uh, bit of all of that, to be sure. And while I do think it has had quite a bit of influence. I do I do want to make sure we're not we're not saying oh, no. Doctor Who invented I'm time not travel. saying Doctor Who. I mean you're completely right with uh H. G. Wells the Time Machines. I've read it, the Morlocks and oh, l- the little nice ones and it's like H. G. Wells like the uh, H. G. Wells came was pretty much the father of science fiction, uh for most rip f- fictional stuff. I mean War of the Worlds, uh, Earth to the Moon the principle of time travel, you are correct, has been used earlier on, but I just think it's Doctor Who that kind of brought it into mainstream media um, with all the toy sales and the uh, novelizations and the movies and the TV shows. They kind of was... Sci-fi was only just getting started with the use of going to the moon. And uh, Doctor Who kind of opened, let's not just go to the moon, let's go to the moon whilst cavemen existed. Uh, branching off from there, actually, because I, I have I have thoughts on this that I'm going to that we're going to dive into as we go along that. So our main uh, time travel plot on Young Justice so far has been the introduction of impulse. And I think one of the things that I find really interesting about the way that impulses time travel thing is handled, as I was thinking about this as I rewatched the episode recently for this, is that most time travel stories the time traveler, whoever they may be, is the protagonist. Doctor Who, from your perspective, watching the show, the Doctor is the protagonist on that show, along with whoever their companion may be at that time. And so watching the show, your narrative is always this person who is from our storyline present is going to the future or the past. But because Impulse is kind of this outside force that enters the show halfway through season two that we've never seen before, it becomes this interesting perspective on that time travel story because from the audience's point of view, it's the story of someone from the future coming to the present. And instead of that person being our protagonist, they're kind of like... In kind of RPG terms, you have Impulse acting as this kind of NPC who kind of just stumbles into this narrative, and our main protagonists, our Nightwing and Robin and Kid Flash, just have to deal with this outside force rather than having Impulse, the time traveler, be our protagonist. We don't even know what Impulse is doing until the end of that episode. And I feel like that just lends this entire time travel story that we've gotten so far a really just interesting perspective that you don't often see in time travel fiction just because of the nature of that kind of storytelling. We assume that the person traveling through time has to be our protagonist. But in the case of Young Justice, they approach it differently and it lends that entire story something that makes it kind of special and different that I feel like stands out a bit among all of all of the time travel media we have gotten in recent years. I, I completely agree. I think that the writers even played off, noticed that as well, because Bart plays it off as he's just on a holiday. Because obviously, anyone showing yeah. up, oh, I've traveled through time, that's normally a big deal of like something terrible's gone wrong. So they, they 
I write it off as Bart's just saying he's on a holiday, which is some vacation. Uh, uh, it's just so to try and divert from that traditional, oh, he's traveled through time. It's got to be super, super important. And we must listen to this, which obviously is out of character from the rest of the team who break down and think, like, think things through rather than just snapping to this. We've got to listen to this guy despite any evidence of it. Yeah. It also, that kind of slow reveal about information from impulses future rewatching that episode and knowing where this whole season goes and everything it's interesting watching it and realizing again that like if you don't know comic book lore going into that episode and you don't know the rest of the season if you're watching it for the first time there is no reason to trust impulse when he first shows up and the show kind of does various kind of subtle things to make you kind of not trust him until you see the full extent of the future that he comes from because he's clearly hiding things, he's clearly not saying things, and it takes us until the end of that episode and the kind of just, like, backwards expositioning of uh, Neutron and Impulse talking about that in the future of, like, this is why he's going back in time, this is what he's doing, and it creates that interesting mystery about what the future is and why Impulse is here that we wouldn't get if this show was told if that entire storyline was told from impulse's perspective instead and that's just some fun time travel writing and you don't even know if it worked at the end of it you just like you're still left with that tense hanging question did it work or didn't it yes because um i have been thinking about this because we recently had um I had a conversation with Ariel Horn that came out where we we talked about this. And so I have been having various people talk to me about how they think that future scene is meant to be read, which is there are many interpretations and they're all fine. Uh, until we know, we, we until we get to actually see that future in real time, we will not know how all that turned out. I do think it's interesting that with all of that, they explicitly at the end of that episode have Neutron and Impulse have a conversation where they break down, they're like, saving Flash is step one. There are other things you need to do. And they don't tell us what any of them are. And as the season goes on, we kind of learn like, oh, Blue Beetle's evil in this future. And so Impulse is kind of trying to make sure that doesn't happen. And those are those are like the ones that we know for sure are part of Impulse's mission on Earth. But we don't know what else he needs to fix. And they have left that kind of open in case there is anything else they want to go down of like things on Impulse's time travel to-do list. But that kind of larger sense of there is a lot that needs to be dealt with opens up that that question of will this work uh, since it is not a matter of one single event being fixed. Well, it's, it's kind of also something that has to be implied that you can't just go back to fix one sole thing when traveling through time. Otherwise, like... For example, in the Time Machine, uh, in the main movie, um, one of the more recent ones, it's predetermined that he can never go back in time to change the events that caused him to create the Time Machine. Or you're just creating the grandfather paradox where you're creating a situation where you end up destroying yourself in the future, or you're creating a situation where you can't alter that situation, that event because it then that event no longer happens that inspires you to create the time machine in the first place so there are those you can't just go back for one sole thing you've got to have multiple reasons and in that case you can't because of that paradox you can't solve all the things that you want to which in my opinion was like does that mean that either flash is going to die or the reach are going to invade and since the reach invasion was defeated and Bart was main reason was going back, well, one of the main reasons for going back was to say Flash. He's still got, you've still got to have that, that reason for him to create the time machine in the first place so he can't save his own grandfather because it's something that's got to happen in order for him to create the time machine. But only if this... God, this is going to get too scientific. I feel like this, I need a chalkboard. It's the idea of... I, I hear you. But it's the... It's also based on the idea of whether you go with time travel creating 
multiple timelines or not kind of thing because it gets into the multiverse which is an established thing in dc universe and what that means and time travel and we've all just spent the past six weeks watching every episode of loki in an uh, obsessive binge watch so we're all thinking about multiple timelines but it's this again this is the problem explaining time travel too much but like finding ways to i think from my perspective, because I am uh, I am a writer, not a scientist, I find that the interesting things about things like time travel paradoxes or the limitations of time travel are how you use them in a story to create meaning and create something that is more meaningful about them. Like they're hearing you explain all of the all of those things about like the idea of if you go back too far in time, you can kill your own grandfather and then you don't exist. And then what happens? It reminded me of there is a really this is going to sound so weird saying it out loud but there is a really kind of sweet and really interesting time travel rom-com that exists this is actually a british movie called uh about time that is the kind this idea that the men in this one family have the ability to time travel and they can only time travel across their own history and they simply pop back into existence in their own body at whatever time period they're traveling to. And one of the, they established several rules throughout that, but one of the main ones is the idea that comes up later on in the movie that they can't travel back further than the the day that any of their kids are born because just the, your life has to play out in such a way that this is the child that you get, whatever the exact events of your life lead to this child being born. And that creates this really, several really interesting, bigger existential questions in this movie that provide a lot of meaning and catharsis to what that means. And like, there is eventually presented the idea of like, the main character deciding whether or not to have another child because it will if he has another kid, he can never talk to his dad in the past anymore ah. and stuff like that because he would be having a kid after the time his father died and stuff like that. And those things, to me, creating that kind of that paradox or that limitation creates something that is far more meaningful and interesting and thought provoking than just some of the things out there that are like hard sci fi that is about just how do I make time travel that could really work? And I'm like, that is far less interesting to me than you giving me time travel that has emotional depth and meaning to it within a narrative. Uh, that that ping pong scene, oh, so oh, it's so sad and heartbreaking. Yes, everyone go watch About Time. I'm pretty sure it's still on Netflix. Go go cry about this weird little time travel movie. I want more genre rom coms. <laughs> go cry at this rom com. Put it on a t shirt. No, no more spoilers for this movie. No, no, no. I wasn't going to see it. The ending. And go into it with no information. I'm just saying that the ending is so good; it does make you think about your own life. Yes, it is a very thoughtful, very good, very good little movie out there in the world. But yeah, so to get back to Young Justice after I've gone off on this tangent about a completely other time travel thing brought this up because that idea of like when it comes to how young justice has set up time travel i am far less concerned with the exact details of how time travel works in young justice and i do appreciate that they that they lean into that idea with sci-fi that some things you're allowed to just hand wave away that they literally like it's got zeta radiation and like chroniton radiation or whatever it is and they go that's how a time machine works and we move on. That's all I need to know. It's like, oh, cool. There's just radiation that doesn't exist. Great. Wonderful. Um, That's all I need. That kind of just the superhero science of it is part of what makes that storyline work as smoothly as it does. Well, there have been some, um, I I agree that there has to be some level of limits to that. I mean, Greg has tried to add reason to uh, DC comics, for example, he doesn't allow Superman to have freeze breath because he just doesn't get how he has freeze breath. So he does try and mix in the reality with fiction. Uh, and to be fair, you can actually do it yourself if you put your hand in front of your uh, in front of your face and you blow with your lips first. You come out, uh, your air comes out cold. 
but if you blow with your mouth open, it comes out hot. So it's the one so it's the one you could superpower you could actually do. <laughs> but he does try and um come across with he doesn't have the speed force include speed force sadly because he doesn't get it. Um he does try to mix that Which science. is valid. Yeah. The speed force uh C- continues to not make full sense to me but it's it is one of those things it's one of those things that's almost a little too hand wavy in comics where it's like why can flash run so fast without breaking himself or the world speed, speed force. force don't ask why is his clothes not rip apart speed force i i, I think uh, i think it's um more due to it's not they explain it's like the force of velocity it should, should be more explained as that, the force of velocity of it in the universe rather than the force of speed, uh, like how gravitational forces work. It, that's my interpretation of what the speed force is, is that it's that universal energy that is velocity, uh, such as you know universal energy that is light or gravity, etc. Something, 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 science. Uh, <laughs> wobbly, wobbly, tiny, why me? Uh, yep, sometimes you can just... Pull, pull the Doctor Who thing. It goes ding when there's stuff, and that's that's all we need. Um, <laughs> I'm just having having long forgotten flashbacks to all of the Doctor Who lines. And fries and egg at thirty paces don't get it anywhere near chickens. Yeah, Blink, love that episode. But yes, uh, weirdly enough, Blink is one of those Doctor Who episodes that similarly to something like the way Young Justice handles it, the time travel elements are outside of what the protagonist of that episode is. Uh, Because Doctor Who is a very weird show that is both like a space travel show, a time travel show, a historical drama sometimes, and like seven other things at once. And the farther into seasons you go, the weirder the plotting of doctor who gets um sometimes for good and sometimes for bad but blink is one of those interesting episodes where the time travel where it's a doctor who episode where the doctor is not the main character and there are a couple and they are across the board all interesting but yeah no that one just having someone who is completely separate from the time travel who is dealing with time travel being thrown at her in the weirdest ways is Again, another interesting take. I, I don't understand why pe- true fans should recommend that as the first episode, like an episode. To oh watch no, because it, it doesn't make any sense. It's like uh, as a Doctor Who fan, you're just watching this and like, okay, I get it. It's a good episode, but you shouldn't introduce doc- people to Doctor Who by watching that episode because he's barely in it. No, it's it is not. It is not at all a good introduction to the format of that show in any way. Mm. I think people just go to it for as like, oh, this is what you, this is how you introduce people to it because it has become so iconic since it came out. And again, for better or for worse, because I think Blink is such a is a very, very good episode on its own. And then as the show went on and since everybody loved the Weeping Angels, they kept trying to incorporate the Weeping Angels in ways that don't always work. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, let's just say the more recent Doctor Who episodes have not gone down well in the uh, country of its origin. <laughs> not not to blame the actors or actresses. I say all this as someone who who deeply loves River Song and has her Funko Pop on my on my shelf. The <laughs> by the time we get into the Eleventh Doctor and trying to do Doctor Who as a full scope, there is an overarching story. It gets a little convoluted to points of time because Doctor Who's time travel works very well episodically and gets very convoluted and confusing the longer you try to stretch a storyline out over multiple episodes. And I say it's not that it's not fun. It's very fun. And a lot of it is very good. It is just sometimes chaotic and hard to follow. (laughs) But I'm going to try to remember that we're a young justice show yes, back yes, to young justice because yes. sometimes I'm bad at tangents. But setting aside Doctor Who for a moment, um, we touched on a little bit on the concept of whether or not the way time travel on Young Justice has been presented so far leans into the idea that uh, the future impulse comes from 
is going to get fixed. And I know since that since that discussion with Ariel Horn came out and we went off about how the future still looks super desolate, some people are like, well, yeah, but that's just foreshadowing for Mount Justice being destroyed. And I agree. I think that's the main reason that is set up that way. But also that scene, even in the future, even after uh, Impulse goes back and quote unquote fixes everything, it still looks li- pre- pretty desolate and pretty dreary and... Maybe there's just a tropical storm coming up the coast, uh, but, and I know it's not raining literal ash anymore, but it still looks not great. So we'll, we'll see. I'm not going to rest easy until we get to that future and see what's up with it. Like you said, a lot of fans brought that up, particularly after season two uh, was cancelled and they were like, well, what's that timeline all about? It's like, and obviously Greg... As frustrating as he can be with no spoilers, he he held it close to his um, chest, and I'm really glad he does that because you like you don't want to go into season three if you've just been he's just told you everything that's going to happen. So big up for Greg for not telling us spoilers, but he did say if you look to the left of Mount Justice, you do see this little village, or and there's bright they're brightly coloured uh, buildings, so it's not as desolate. As it could have been, but th- so there is life there. There is a town of some sort. Whether or not it's the one hundred percent happy harbour in its pristine condition, minus the missing mountain, is is entirely up to interpretation until we get to that time frame. And I will point out, as someone who just recently rewatched this episode and rewound that multiple times to check whether that town is there in both the awful future and the fixed future. It's there in both, uh, so that doesn't necessarily set me at ease. It looks a little more brightly colored in the uh, supposedly fixed future, but <laughs> I, because that was one of my thoughts. I was like, was that town there at the beginning of this episode? Let's go and rewind and fast forward until I can confirm that for my brain. So yeah, we'll, we will see. Time will tell. And speaking of whether time will tell with all of this, the end of season three has introduced a new possible uh, time travel element into into the whole mix for this series by having at the very end of season three that reveal of a Legion of Superheroes ring uh, that made wonderful co-host Rich Howard scream with joy the first time he watched this because he loves the Legion of Superheroes with his whole heart. And we've touched on it before and talked about it before on the show, but the Legion of Superheroes is supposed to be a group of mostly teenage heroes who kind of time travel from a thousand years in the future, usually to talk to Superman, but we'll see We'll see how this show goes with that. And that opens up so many new possibilities. So from your perspective, what narrative doors do you think that that could open for this show? Well... It, it does open up the entire possibility of regular use of time travel because obviously the Re- Legion rings have the ability to take their wearers to back and forth. But whether or not it's going to be that way is it's, the possibilities are limitless with the use of now that you throw in time travel. Whether or not the Legion is going to be as main president as people think it's going to be, it, time's going to have to tell. I think you wouldn't hold on to that uh, Legion ring freeze frame for so long if you if it's not going to be important in season four. It could have just simply been uh, an Easter egg, um, such as there's a poster in Wally's room that has a very striking resemblance to Artemis uh, in season two of a blonde in uh, wearing red. So it, it's not simple in the easter egg of oh there's a legionnaire ring it's like they froze on it they zoomed in on it the legionnaires are coming or the legionnaires are here whether or not that they are here to protect the timeline itself whether or not they are here to prevent one particular thing from happening or whether or not they are just being real uh time vacationists and just seeing the formation of the uh, League, which would then become Legion, as in like this was the founding moment when uh, Black Lightning takes over. This is when they start following all the, the rules and the, uh, the um, 
beliefs and system to lead to them that they're stopping off. It, it's difficult to tell without knowing what future they've come from. If they've come from a future where everything's all right, then obviously they're not going to have to mess around. If they've come from an apocalyptic future um, where dark side's taken over, then they're going to have to make, find out what uh, alterations they um, have happened in the past that they need to fix in order to get the future that they are, that they used to live in, because the rings also protect them from time space anomalies as well as uh, atmospheric space. Yeah, chaos. Trying to make time travel work. <laughs> it's a ring. No need for a big clunky time machine anymore. I'd still prefer a TARDIS any day. <laughs> it's got a pool. It's got a library. It's comfortable. But uh, speaking of all those various doors that this could open up narratively, are there any time travel storylines from the from comics from DC Comics that you think might show up in the future or that you'd be excited to see happen uh on Young Justice if they ever just if if they lean into this time travel thing they've set up do you, is there anything that you'd be super excited to see them do with it see i'm not too well versed in uh legion history. The only time travel story I know is Flashpoint, which involves obviously going back. Flash goes back in time, changes something, Flashpoint event happens and all the uh, alternate universe, uh, New 52 stuff happens. The um, only comic storyline I think uh, that would be fun to uh, see and could actually be done is thankfully to the help of timestamps of where you could have these events that happen in the past happen in episodes along time along the same lines of events that have to be happening in that apocalyptic future. And um, it, it re- this really relies on one key um, speculation for season four involving red-headed speedster, which I will get to later when we come to speculations. But because of timestamps, we are able to have those moments both in the past and in the future. And I think what Phantoms is all going to be all about is phantom timelines and phantom time events. Because you're, if a particular character comes back, it's so difficult to explain this. Well, my, okay, it, it involves time travel and it's my speculation that Wally is not dead. Wally hasn't used a speed force. Wally has actually used light speed theory to travel into the future because he was running around a circle, uh, getting charged up by energy. And if you really, I did this in one of my YouTube videos, if you slow it down, you actually see two waves happen. I'm using hand signals despite this being audio, which is really stupid. Um, there is a wave that goes backwards, which seems to be physical matter of his suit, but there's this energy wave that shoots forwards and then, dis- uh, then, uh, then uh, disappears. I think the energy of the storm has supercharged Wally to the point he actually lo- travels faster than light uh, and still retains his form. And if you travel faster than light, you actually can travel forward into the future, which means he ends up in the future of this apocalyptic um, world and timeline of Dark Side taking over the world as a mess. We get the um, impulse future of Mount Justice, and he interacts through season um through season four with characters that have survived this apocalypse like a 60 year old a hundred year old miss martian or a, a really old captain marvel or some of the younger generation who have survived the apocalypse so you could have leanne there as, as like arrowette or you could have the younger generation damian wayne could be batman now and it can, you can split between these two timelines of the past events with the current justice league crew and the new and the future apocalyptic phantom time zone of Wally trying to survive this disaster. And the Legion showing up just to try and fix it for them that both timelines kind of fix themselves in the fact that Wally goes back, fixes all the things that needed to prevent the apocalypse, like dark side invasion, destruction of war, etc. And then you've got that time flow. It's like, switch out the word Phantom, the variant, and that's kind of what I'm talking about. <laughs> but yeah, I guess we'll just have to have to wait and see what happens since <laughs> we 
don't we know nothing about season four at this time. We know absolutely nothing. And <laughs> we will just have to wait and see. I would like to add one more thing, because this reminded me, I was listening to your podcast two days ago, and you were discussing the nuclear option and how you dreaded that. I do remember um, Brandon Bietti saying, there's no point, we put it in so we could have it in the future as a possibility. No. So if no. if we have this apocalyptic timeline, we could have the nuclear option shown and seen and that goes into that apocalypse. So you can both have your cake and eat it that you see the nuclear option happen, but it's fixed in with Wally going back into the past. It's a it's a cake that I want nothing to do with. I don't I don't want to see it. I don't want I don't want it anywhere near my superhero. Lives. I don't want to see children get killed either or the ambi crushed in rubble, but I'm saying no, it's no. no We don't we don't put that energy out into the world. We don't say these things. I'm sorry, but <laughs> with time travel and everything, it could happen. I think that the death of Leanne uh, during um, uh, during that particular comic line was stupid. And uh, don't touch my baby; she's fine. Leave her alone. But it is something that has to be discussed as a possibility when you don't know what's going to happen in season four. Personally, I find everything about the nuclear option that was introduced in season three to me, works fine as a narrative element that is a threat that is never used. Because even just having that suspense of having that threat exist in this world is, to me, fine and dandy as a bit of a thing. Like, I don't I don't need to see the worst thing happen to know that the possibility of the worst thing happening is always a threat in a story. But that's also because I'm me, and I and I don't want that grim dark in my in my fun superhero stories. Yeah. But we shall see what we shall see. We shall see what happens in season four. Since again, we know nothing. Uh, <laughs> Except Wally's alive. We know that. We don't even know that. We suspect it. We heavily suspect it, but we don't know. We've we've talked about it many times on our show. We also. Across the board, are pretty sure Wally's alive. We talked about it in Ariel's episode. I talked about it in Ariel's episode that narratively it makes sense for Wally to be alive and to just be out there somewhere and for us to not know where he is or how to get there. But uh, but we still don't know. So I still put that as as it is technically speculation until it is confirmed because that's just the safest way to go about everything on this show. Nothing is confirmed until I see it happen on screen. Has my uh, light speed theory given you any comfort of how he could be alive? I've I've long thought that Wally could easily be in the future. So I don't. It's one of those things where I, again, I am not a I am not a scientist. I do not know how anything works. I just go with. Well, he's not dead. Do I know where he is? No. Do I have any idea how he's not dead? Absolutely not. I just, <laughs> narratively and storytelling-wise, am pretty darn sure. Well, he's not dead. Oh, I, I, I came up with that theory the second I watched it and see, saw him dis- disintegrate. It's like, so from the second season two was cancelled, I've been sitting on this for years, waiting it, for it to happen. Oh, come on, please let me be right. I want to be right. I want him to be alive. So thank you for spending some time with us here in the Watchtower today, Michael. Uh, where can people find you here on Earth Prime? Uh, thank you. It's been a pleasure as well uh, talking to you, Emily. Most people can find me as a YouTuber under the name of Dark Superboy uh, on YouTube. I'm currently at 825 subscrib- subscribers. would love to make it to 1,000. Uh, I've got a lot of videos related to Young Justice, including the live uh, quizzes with guest stars of Zero Fazal, Eric Lopez, Dina Robertson, Cam Bowen, um, or many quizzes that you yourself have listened to and uh, taken part to as a, as a listen, and was absolutely amazing. I've also done some, created a live animation of the audio play of the prize, and when season four comes out, I'll be doing spoiler speculations for that as well. So you can find me as Dark Superboy on YouTube, but I'm also founder of, as I've already said, Young Justice fans, Deviant Art, and Young Justice Season 3 on Deviant Art. 
And thank you to everyone for spending some time with us listening. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series online, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And if that somehow is not enough for you, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a review, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones and they can be kind of difficult to track down. So just give us a heads up. And if you are able to support us monetarily and want to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And as always, stay well, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well.